As spring gave way to summer, Auntie Kath, Uncle Charles, Nana and I began spending either the mornings or afternoons on Sundays down on Babacoon Beach. Never in England did I enjoy such perfect weather in such perfect surroundings. But when Father, who throughout the Blitz had worked day and night as a stretcher bearer, came to Torquay for a short holiday, I started feeling homesick. After giving notice to the coal merchant's partners, who spent my last days gloomily reconciling themselves what to the prospect say? of having a girl in the office, and bidding an affectionate that. farewell to my landlady, Mrs. French, and her sister, Gwen, I returned to London after an absence of one year. St. Paul's Cathedral received a direct hit when a bomb smashed through the east end of the cathedral and demolished the high altar. For two weeks, I attended boys' brigade parades and Bible classes across the road from the Baptist church at the Anglican church, whose company and ours had now amalgamated. But most of the old familiar faces were gone, and the atmosphere was different. Besides, having realized in Torquay that I'd never believed in Christianity, the hymns and prayers now seemed empty and unreal. Dennis Philip Lingwood reached the age of 18 and, as was to be expected in wartime, was eligible for military service. What was unexpected was that his house was bombed and his parents separated. Not so unexpectedly, he found his way to the Buddhist society, took the refugees and precepts from a Burmese monk, Khmer Raid Warden, met lifelong friends and correspondents, and submitted an article for the journal which expressed his perception of the non-sectarian nature of the Buddha Dharma. Soon after his arrival in India, Dennis, a wireless operator with the Royal Signals, arranged a transfer to Ceylon. Buddhism had long been suppressed under colonial rule, but thanks to the intervention of the Theosophical Movement, the first Buddhist flag was raised to celebrate Wesak openly in 1885 at Kotahina, the ancestral home of Bhikkhu Soma. Wandering about, Dennis discovered an ashram of the Ramakrishna mission, a Hindu Vedanta organization near the camp. Swami Vipulananda had already roused my interest by recounting well-authenticated stories of the holy man's extraordinary powers. He was believed to be not less than 160. So it was with considerable excitement that I learned of the unexpected arrival in Colombo of Yoga Swami of Jaffna. During our conversation, I had an uncanny sense that he was following my every thought. This feeling was intensified by the way he sometimes answered questions I had not formulated. Every now and then he ran his hand up and down my arm, squeezing it as he did so, and muttering, Very good boy, very good boy, very good chair, I can sit in this chair, very good boy, very good chair. There was another visitor to the ashram, 
Swami Pavitrananda spoke of the happiness of a monk's life, which appealed to Dennis. In letters to his now separated parents, he expressed a wish to stay on in India after demobilization and become a monk. Six months later, Dennis requested a transfer to Calcutta to see more of his family. His mother's youngest brother, Uncle Dick, was a member of the governor of Bengal's band. They got along so well that when his wife and young daughter wanted a change of air, they took Dennis with them. Once left to his own devices, Dennis hired a pony for a white knuckle ride to Goom. A few miles out of Darjeeling, and some hundreds of feet higher than the town, is Tiger Hill, another viewpoint which attracts visitors from every corner of the earth. Later, I learned that the founder of this monastery, the great Tibetan saint and yogi Dhamma Geshe Rinpoche, Lama Govinda's teacher, had installed there the image of the Lord Maitreya, the coming Buddha, as a prophecy that the worldwide dissemination of Buddhism was at hand. To me, the great figure portended the dedication of my own life to the service of the Dharma. Packed like a sardine, Dennis endured a terrible voyage. Far to the south, the army was gathering the troops to be demobilized. It's hard to believe that not so long ago, war surged around it and even in it. The colony itself was a hive of activity, though this could not be said of the signals unit. Dennis took the opportunity to meet Chinese Buddhists, as well as make friends with theosophists. What attracted me most of all was the way everybody practiced brotherhood, the first of the Theosophical Society's three objectives. The members I became most intimately associated with were Rie von Christensterner, a second-generation Theosophist, and her husband. Rie was doing work there as an editor, and they very quickly developed a very close friendship. And he used to go and have dinner with Rie and her husband, so he was from Sweden, she was from Holland. Besides the pleasant, friendly atmosphere of the meetings, the works on Theosophy and Indian Tantra I borrowed from the Lodge Library were a revelation. There was also an abridged version of Tibet's great yogi Milarepa. As I read it, my hair stood on end and tears came into my eyes. If I had any doubts about the nature of my vocation, they were now dispelled. Over a ten-year period, I wrote letters on her behalf to Banti at Majumaloka. And in fact, it was Re who invited Dennis to give a talk at the Theosophical Society. And that was his launch, you could say, of his speaking career. Friends. What made the members of the Lodge think a soldier of 21 would be a good speaker? I do not know. To my astonishment, my first lecture was a success. Mr. Chairman. Ideas wove themselves Persian carpet-wise into intricate patterns without difficulty. Madam Chairman. After this initial effort, I was in great demand as a lecturer, not only at the lodge, but also at the Buddhist Union of Chinese Temples. When I was at school, my class teacher, Smokey Joe, who had also been father's class teacher, encouraged me in the writing of essays and gave me my first opportunity of addressing an audience. I never felt nervous, however big the audience. In fact, the bigger the audience, the better I felt about it. Hello, G3CFN. This is VS1. In discussion with Rhee and Sten von Christensterner, and following the example set by the Chinese monks, I became a vegetarian. At the end of one lodge meeting, a young Indian member asked if a Buddhist could be a soldier. I frankly admitted that he could not, adding that I hoped soon to be able to extricate myself. Mm. 
Ernie, the ginger-haired cockney who had travelled down with me, and I were taken to a hut containing a dozen army cots and told that we belonged to C Squad. We were both more than a little nervous. For the next three weeks, I felt as though my soul was petrified. Had this defensive mechanism not come into operation, the futility of the existence into which I had been so abruptly plunged might have driven me mad. The chief topic of conversation in the hut was sex. Ernie and I and the rest of the youngsters, who had nothing of our own to contribute, listened while the older men discussed the size, shape and mechanics of their respective organs, their sexual experiences, the different modes of copulation and the sexual physiology of the female all in the most exhaustive detail. Have you read the papers this morning? But once our natural curiosity was satisfied, we found this incessant preoccupation with sex both boring and disgusting, and turned away to discuss more interesting subjects among ourselves. One Sunday afternoon, when Dennis was 13, his father handed him his copy of Health and Strength magazine, and pointing to one of the articles, said, I think you should read this. Though I read the article on masturbation with genuine interest, I looked with much greater interest at the photos of well-built young men that were a leading feature of the magazine. That I was attracted to older boys and to young men in this way did not make me feel guilty. Nor did I feel guilt when the attraction started to assume a definitely sexual character as it did a year or two later. It was a feeling that had arisen in me quite naturally. It was part of me, and I did not question its rightness. At the same time, I instinctively knew, even at that early age, that it was something of which society disapproved, and that I should not talk about it to anyone. There was a Buddhist temple on the outskirts of the city. Bhikkhu Soma, a grimly intense monk of mixed Dutch and Sinhalese descent, bore the brunt of my questioning. Producing the booklet I had bought in Ceylon, I asked if he could recommend this method of meditation. His reply was unhesitating. Anapanasati was the best of methods, the method employed by the Buddha on the eve of his enlightenment. That night I sat beneath my mosquito net, meditating while others slept. Success was immediate. My mind became at first buoyant, then filled with peace and purity, and finally penetrated by a quintessential ethereal bliss that was so intense I had to break off the practice. The conditions under which I was then living were not ideal for meditation. Within a month of the experiment with meditation, I encountered the person with whom I was to embark on a systematic practice of the method. From the moment Buddha Maharaj introduced us to each other, we were friends. Rabindra Kumar Banerjee was a tall, well-built Bengali some three years my senior. We were both in khaki, but he wore the tricolored insignia of the Indian National Congress. Being of a frank, communicative nature, with more than a touch of naive boastfulness, he told me about himself without either restraint or reserve. Though born in an orthodox Brahmin family, Banerjee was an avowed enemy of the inhuman caste system sanctioned by the tradition to which he belonged by birth. Nevertheless, discerning beneath his anti-religious outbursts a strong ethical motivation, I not only spoke to him about religion, but lent him books on Vedanta to read on his return to the army. Conscripts awaiting demobilization were left in a limbo of keeping up appearances. One demobbed pal, now in Britain, who had had notions of taking up a spiritual life, wrote with devastating news. 
I've had to forget about India. The government will not let us leave. Good luck. I obtained leave to visit Uncle Dick. Despite three years in the army, I found the pleasures of family life thoroughly insipid. My last month in European society was in fact memorable for the distaste it inspired. One of the first things I did in Calcutta was to contact Banerjee. Ever rapid in transition from one extreme to the other, Banerjee now denounced politics as a menace to society. He declared that religious and cultural activities alone constituted the true means of India's upliftment. Besides, having been cheated by his partner, he was as disgusted with business life as I was with the social life of the English in India. Rabindra Banerjee and Dennis steered their youthful energy towards two of the city's main religious organizations, the Buddhist Mahabodhi Society and the Hindu Ramakrishna Cultural Institute. When the Secretary Swami at the Institute suggested I work on a revised edition of the Cultural Heritage of India, I told him that it would not be possible to have one of us without the other. By then, Banerjee and I had a strong attachment. We complemented each other to such an extent that neither was able to move without the other. In the evenings, Banerjee more often than not harangued the student inmates of the institute about politics, while I study books on Buddhism. His Holiness the High Priest, as Jinnaratana had instructed me he was to be styled, had the appearance of a well-groomed, saffron-robed vulture, and there was a constant sense of something unpleasant going on behind the scenes. His Holiness was invited to send a representative to the All India Religions Conference to be held at Ahmedabad. As I had already lectured in the Mahabodhi's Hall, he decided to send me to speak on Buddhism. As the only two Buddhist delegates, Panditji and I, despite my misgivings, inevitably became acquainted. He gave a scholarly presidential address, delivered in impeccable English, from which I understood that though representing Buddhism, he was himself a Hindu. According to Panditji, Anadamai, whom I had not heard of before, was very sympathetic towards Buddhism and had in fact given her approval for an organization to propagate the Dharma, a project he had started many years earlier. Perhaps, under Anandamayi's guidance, we could work together for the revival of Buddhism in India. Later, it became clear that none of his grandiose schemes had ever progressed beyond the fundraising stage. Dennis took to wearing comfortable Indian clothes and to complete the transformation, he adopted the name Dharma Priya. With Pandit Ji and his companion Sudhir, the three set out to find Ananda Mai. Ananda Mai moved from place to place as the spirit moved her, spending a week here and a month there. My first impression of the blissful mother was perhaps the most favorable. On entering the ashram, I saw in the centre of the group a queenly figure, who I at once knew must be Anandamayi. She struck me as being strangely Buddha-like in appearance. At the same time, I became aware that an intense peace, purity and coolness was not only pervading the room, but as it were blowing from her like a delicate fresh breeze. I received a despairing letter from Banerjee, still stuck at the Mahabodhi Society. I have no money and been treated in an unbearably humiliating fashion by His Holiness. A friend in need is a friend indeed. I wired him a hundred rupees for the journey 
and with Panditji's consent, Banerjee joined the Vijaya Vahini, the army for the revival of Buddhism in India. Food occupies a place of unique importance in the life of the Orthodox Hindu. So it was inevitable that Banerjee's first conflict with the ashramites should have been in connection with lunch. Though all could sit together in the hall, members of a lower caste were not permitted to eat with members of a higher caste. I had been banished to a veranda with the one other foreigner. To the infinite scandal of the ashramites, who for all his disclaimers knew he was a Brahmin, Banerjee announced he was a Buddhist and therefore had no caste. From then on, he sat with us to eat and cracked embarrassing jokes about the three untouchables. Ananda Mai apparently had not heard of Anapanasati before, but when, with my friend as interpreter, I explained the successive stages of the practice, she nodded approvingly. One hint on how one-pointedness of mind that had been lost at a higher stage of the practice could be recovered at a lower stage proved useful during the whole of my subsequent practice of this method. At the conclusion of the interview, Banerjee asked her to bestow on him a religious name. As I was already known as Dharma Priya, lover of the law, Ananda Mai named Banerjee Sachipriya, lover of truth. Both of us felt strangely moved and elated by this interview. It was with profounder bows than usual that we retired from her presence. Over the next four weeks, Dharma Priya and Satya Priya meditated in a clearing in the jungle at dawn and at dusk. At Ananda Mai's suggestion, each kept a record of their experiences in meditation. Dharma Priya had visions of a symbolic world. When the Buddha developed an elephant's trunk, the blissful mother declared it a sign of success. However disinclined we felt to accept Ananda Mai as the third full incarnation of God, as her followers averred, we saw no reason to question the fact that she lived in a state of consciousness that transcended the waking state as much as the waking state transcends sleep, or that she possessed psychic powers of a high order. The little hill station was full of the damp white mist that came flying in over the treetops. Though Pandit G continued to treat us with kindness, we were beginning to have an insight into the true nature of the aged adventurer's activities. We felt that in leaving the Mahabodhi Society, we had jumped out of the frying pan into the fire. There was only one way out, however lofty the ideals with which they were founded. Religious societies and organizations had a tendency to degenerate in the hands of selfish human beings. We would follow the example of the Buddha and go forth into the life of homelessness as saffron-clad wanderers in search of truth. Suitcases and watches were sold, shoes given away, and identification papers destroyed. Liberated and carrying a bundle of books between them, they headed for Ceylon. For three nights they squeezed into third-class luggage racks. They were confident Buddhist Ceylon would offer them a place to study and meditate. On reaching port, the undocumented Buddhists were politely told to return to sea. Thank you. 
Back in India, undeterred, they set off to walk to the Himalayas, begging for food and deflecting questions about identity. The homeless ones found these activities ill-suited a life of study and meditation. Fortunately, a Ramakrishna mission Swami offered them an empty ashram, which could be home for as long as they wished, and their needs could be balanced with those of their patrons. The sharp red gravel cut the tender soles of our bare feet as we trudged along the stony path. A few minutes later we saw the ashram. The Swami had not told us that the ashram had remained unoccupied because it was haunted. At five, while it was still dark, we were awoken by the sounds coming from the two temples a mile away across the river. Every morning Satyapriya washed the cement floor and the altar, while I placed flowers on the framed photographs and marked their foreheads with fresh sandalwood paste as though they were living persons. This did not constitute puja in the orthodox Hindu sense of worshipping the deity. The feelings that inspired me were purely aesthetic. Later on, when Satyapriya started performing the ritual worship of Sri Ramakrishna as an incarnation of God, my heart turned cold. Living cheek by jowl for 15 months, they shared remarkable experiences of clairvoyance and clairaudience. Just as often, they came up against their temperaments. Dharma Priya was vigilant. Satya Priya was impetuous. Satya Priya had abundant energy, which he directed into social work in bursts. When the same intensity was pointed towards spiritual practice, the effect was alarming. Satyapriya had almost exhausted himself with his austerities. So ardent was Satyapriya's desire for spiritual progress that he went so far as to practice pranayama, or breath control, as outlined in Vivekananda's Raja Yoga, in a particularly extreme form. Exhale. 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 He also lengthened his periods of silence and started fasting for weeks on end. Among the two or three books that remained of the ashram library was a tiny volume, a biography of a saintly Hindu lady written by her teacher, both apparently having lived quite recently. We heard that someone from Muvatupuza had been to see a great saint and had returned a changed man. We were living in the same world as one who had realized the truth. There was no time to be lost. As he beamed at us from the armchair, Swami Ramdas was the very picture of grandfatherly benignity. The only unusual thing about him were his ears, with lobes of extraordinary length. Constituting himself the spokesman, Satyapriya gave a full and frank account of our year together in the haunted ashram. Throughout the recital, Ramdas listened attentively. But when Satyapriya came to his outbursts of anger, as well as the austerities we'd practiced, particularly his own prolonged fasts, Ramdas's face took on an expression of the deepest concern, as if unable to credit his ears. Living with my warm-hearted but irascible companion had at times been a nightmare. Ever since he had given up on the industrial school and other projects, his constitutional unreasonableness and irritability had grown steadily worse. I knew from bitter experience that if Satyapriya thought people were paying greater attention to my opinion than to his, there would be trouble. I learned this could be avoided only if I said little and let Satyapriya occupy the centre stage. Talking in the semi-darkness of the veranda one night, we happened to find ourselves disagreeing over something. Knowing how impatient of contradiction Satyapriya was, I at once saw the danger and stopped pressing my point. But it was too late. Despite all my efforts to pacify him, he suddenly struck me a tremendous blow in the face with his fist. By the time our manager had come running, 
Satyapriya was dabbing my bleeding cheek and rocking me in his arms in an agony of remorse. From the minute Satyapriya had started telling the story of our life together, it had seemed that we were making confession of all our weaknesses and imperfections. But this confession was being received by Ramdas, like the ocean receiving into its pure depths the sullied waters of a river. The one thing needful was wholehearted love and devotion towards the spiritual ideal. From that, everything would follow. One morning, we found Ramdas reading The Light of Asia. As soon as he saw us, he exclaimed, Your mantra is Om Mani Padme Hum. With this mantra of the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, I was well content, especially as Ramdas had never been known to initiate anyone into anything other than the Rama mantra. Ramdas was militant against caste and would not allow any discrimination on account of caste within the ashram precincts. The majority of the 15 or 20 devotees then staying at the ashram were very ordinary people. But the atmosphere of genuine friendliness and devotion that pervaded the place far exceeded anything that I had yet experienced. Ramdas often spoke of the saints and sages whose blessings he had sought at the outset of his quest. The one for whom he felt the greatest veneration was Ramana Maharishi. Towards the end of our stay, he urged us to see the Maharishi for ourselves. Before setting off, we asked if Ramdas could inscribe our new notebooks. Teaching us a profound spiritual lesson, in mine he wrote, Love Dharma, for Dharma is truth. And in Satyapriya's, Love truth, for truth is Dharma. Having spoken at length on the need for brotherly love between us, Ramdas made clear his blessings were always with us. Since we had no money, we had decided to walk all the way to Tiruvannamalai. However, when we went to pay our last respects to Ramdas, he handed us two third-class railway tickets and told us firmly that we were to go by train. Behind the ashram rose the twin peaks of Arunachala, the hill of light, sacred throughout the Tamil country, the mere name of which had magically drawn the 17-year-old Ramana to the spot some 50 years earlier. It was larger and run on very different lines to Anand Ashram. As wandering ascetics, Satyapriya and I were relegated to the non-Brahmin side of the partitioned dining hall. Darshan at the ashram was truly a memorable experience. Sitting there with Satyapriya, I felt a stream of purity flow over me until body, mind, thought and emotion had all been washed away and there remained nothing but a great shining peace. With the Maharishi's blessing, we established ourselves in Virupaksha cave, named for the saint who had lived five or six hundred years ago and had been buried there. Much of the space was occupied by Virupaksha's tomb, on which we slept at night. Chanting our new Avalokiteshvara mantra, both to ourselves and together, to a tune of Satyapriya's devising, we left the cave only every two or three days. Most of our time was devoted to meditation. One night, I found myself, as it were, out of the body and in the presence of Amitabha. The colour of the Buddha was a deep, rich, luminous red, like that of rubies, yet soft and glowing, like the light of the setting sun, and more wonderful than any earthly red. I was now convinced our two years' apprenticeship in the holy life had come to an end, and we would retrace our steps to North India and seek formal ordination there. Setting their sights on an auspicious ordination on the full moon anniversary of the Buddha's enlightenment, Dharmapriya and Satyapriya crossed the subcontinent. What the innocent wanderers did not know was that hundreds of poor Hindus turned up at Sanath asking for ordination just to be supported. 
The road along which we were now walking was the very one, perhaps, which the Buddha himself had trod 2,500 years ago, on the last stage of his journey from Bodh Gaya, soon after enlightenment. Then, rising above the treetops, we caught sight of the pinnacle of the Mulagandakuti Vihara, the Sinhalese temple founded by Anagarika Dharmapala 20 years earlier. We were there. When we told the resident monks that for the past few months we had not possessed as much as a single penny, it was clear they wanted nothing whatever to do with us. In the eyes of these representatives of pure Buddhism, we were no better than beggars. At the first opportunity, we made our formal request for ordination. After listening to our account in silence, they said they would consult among themselves and let us know their decision. It was not long in coming. As the Mahabodhi Society was at present very short of funds, this consent would not be forthcoming. Back at the Ramakrishna mission, we felt as though the bottom had dropped out of the universe and that we now hung aimless and directionless in a void. In addition to my own disappointment, I had to cope with the consequences of Satyapriya's humiliation, so painful to his self-respect, and be not only the confident, but the scapegoat for his violent anger. What right have they to refuse ordination to two candidates who, for all they know, are spiritually far more advanced than themselves? Were it not for your insidious influence, I would have had nothing to do with Buddhism, nothing to do with the filth and corruption of the Mahabodhi society. I'm quite happy to remain where I was born, a Hindu. If the worst comes to the worst, I can always join Ramakrishna mission. They might not be very spiritual, but at least they do good social work. I could not help recognizing the justice of much that Satyapriya said, and had to admit to myself that both the fact and the manner of their refusal had hurt me far more deeply than it had hurt him. Suddenly, Satyapriya recollected that an Indian monk at Sarnath had mentioned a monk scholar who was teaching Pali and Buddhist philosophy at Benares Hindu University. He would be able to help us. Having listened in sympathetic silence, Bhikkhu Jagdish Kashyap, slowly bringing out the words from the depths of his enormous frame, advised us to go to Kusinara and there find Yu Chandramani. Provided we were able to convince him of our sincerity, there was no reason why he should not give us ordination. The holy month of Vaishak had already begun, and at the back of both our minds was the hope that on Vaishaka Purnima, the full moon day anniversary of the Buddha's enlightenment, it would be possible for us to be ordained. Kevalam. Such a priya and I plodded on across the sun-baked earth, grimly covering 12 to 15 miles a day. A scorching, dust-laden wind was blowing off the desert, and the sun was so intense we had to walk along with a wet towel wrapped around the head for protection. After two or three hours of walking, we generally halted beside a river for our breakfast and a bath. At night, we took refuge in a temple or an ashram. The only vestige of spiritual activity we saw was the smoking of ganja. Often a sympathetic villager would bring us something to eat, and Satyapriya would become involved in discussion. Towards the eighth day, our stops became more and more frequent. Before long, we were heartened by the sight of the majestic dome of the Mahaparinirvana stupa rising in the distance. We were there. The resident monastic community of Kusinara was smaller than that of Sarnath. In fact, it consisted of only Unchandramani himself and an Indian disciple. There were, however, a number of shaven-headed, yellow-robed Anagarikas. Not nuns, but devoted observers of the Ten Precepts. Uchandramani had come to Kusinara in 1901 to help build the first Buddhist temple to be constructed in India in modern times. He had not only resided there without interruption ever since, 
but continued his predecessor's work of restoring the ruins and making the place once more a living centre of Buddhism. We could hardly have found a more suitable person to ask for ordination. When the moon that rose every night above the shadowy dome of the Mahaparinirvana stupa was almost full, Uchandramani called us to his room and told us that he would not be accepting any responsibility for our future training, nor would it be possible for us to stay with him at Kusinara. But if it was ordination we wanted, then he would ordain us with the greatest pleasure, and we could have his blessing into the bargain. At nine o'clock on the morning of Vaishaka Purnima, we received the long-expected summons to the chapter house. Here, Uchandramani handed us our robes and told us to go and take a bath and put them on. The public then gathered in the shrine room was not being photographed. Seven years later in Thailand, and under the watchful eye of English bhikkhu Kapalavado, who narrates the film, Three of his protégés are coached in the precise recitation. At the back you see the title fans, those decorated fans. They are for bhikkhus. Every bhikkhu in Thailand has one as his authority. As the scene moves, you see the group there sitting quite happily, smoking cigarettes, everybody around quite happy, uh, everybody very friendly. The three refugees had not only to be repeated three times each, but repeated in both Pali and Sanskrit. They commence by the words, Sanghang bangte upasampadang ya chama olong patuno bhante sangho anukampang upadaya. Please, venerable sirs, may we enter? The more formal part of the proceedings ended with the Mahatera solemnly adjuring us in the last words which the Buddha had addressed to his disciples as he lay on his deathbed only a couple of hundred yards away. With mindfulness, strive on. Having been spiritually reborn, we had to be given new names. Satyapriya would be known as Buddharakshita. Dharmapriya would be known as Dharmarakshita. When it was pointed out that Uchandramani already had a disciple called Dharmarakshita, our preceptor said, with a gesture of good-humoured impatience, let him be Sangharakshita. For most people who had come to Kusinara for the Vaishaka Purnima, our ordination was only a very minor event in the thrice sacred day, if indeed they knew of it at all. Strung out behind the brass band, a line of monks with red parasols, white clad laity with black umbrellas, and school children with books on their heads wound their way through the fields to the neighboring villages. Unfortunately, the brass band had got not more than halfway when the sky became overcast. Thunder crashed, lightning flashed, and the rain came down in such torrents that the procession had to be abandoned. The rainy season had begun. Equipped with our robes and our bowls, as a bird with its two wings, there was now no limit to where we might go. Their first outing as newly fledged novices was to walk all the way from Kushinara to Palpatanzen in Nepal and contact some of U Chandramani's disciples. Six weeks later, they returned to Benares to pay their respects to their kind advisor, Jagjish Kashap, and to plan their next move. Buddharachita was strongly in favour of our making another attempt to enter Ceylon, where we could study and then take the higher ordination. I was against this plan, partly because I had no means of identification, and partly because I did not feel well enough to embark on further wanderings. With characteristic generosity, it was Bhikkhu Kashyap who resolved the dilemma. If it would be of any use, there was room for one of us at Buddha Kuti, but only for one. This of course meant the end of the partnership between Buddha Rakshita and myself, which had now lasted uninterruptedly for two and a half years. After prolonged discussion, my impetuous friend suddenly announced that his mind was made up. 
he would go to Ceylon. In any case, it was me that Bhikkhu Kashyap wanted as a disciple, not him. Once the actual parting was over, and I was once more on my own, my predominant feeling was one of relief, as I realised how great the strain of living with Buddha Akshita had been. He went off to Sri Lanka, and he used to write to me from time to time. In Sri Lanka, he had a very difficult time indeed, huh? because he was, you may remember, a Brahmin by birth and a Hindu by birth, and though he had, in a way, become a Buddhist, there were many Hindu, not to say Brahminical, notions still lingering in his mind. So in Sri Lanka, his uh, Hindu and Brahminical rigidity came up against Theravadin rigidity. <laughs> and in the end, or Theravadin rigidity, I believe, won. <laughs> but uh, he had a very tough time. He worked with some quite pathetic letters. Even so, but for him, I might never have spent two years as a wandering ascetic, might never have made the difficult transition from the old way of life to the new, and for that I was deeply grateful. In less than a week, I was feeling perfectly at home in my new surroundings, and had embarked on a course of study that was to keep me busy almost without interruption for seven of the quietest and happiest months I have ever known. Life at Buddha Kuti was simple in the extreme, and there were no distractions. Seven months later, teacher and pupil made a preaching tour of Bhikkhu Kashyap's ancestral homeland, the ancient Magadha of the Buddha's time. After four weeks touring Bihar, we reached Kalimpong, which turned out to be a pleasant hill station with a Norman church, European-style bungalows, and splendid views of the snows of Mount Kachanjunga. We were accommodated in a building belonging to the town's Nua Buddhist community, one of whose members, a young trader, Kashyapji had once met in Calcutta. Soon we had established a daily routine. After I'd had my Pali lesson, we walked through the high street to the same trader's office where we had lunch. We had not been three weeks in Kalimpong when Kashyapji informed me that he would not be returning to the Benares Hindu University. Instead, he would spend some time meditating in the jungles of Bihar. Perhaps, as he meditated, it would become clear to him what he ought to do next. He told me as he left the following morning, I was to remain in Kalimpong. Stay here and work for the good of Buddhism. The word of the Guru was not to be disobeyed, and I bowed in silent acquiescence. Sangharachita had just read Thomas Merton's book of essays and was engaged in surrendering his ego to his teacher's will. Though I did not know it at the time, I was to spend 14 years in Kalimpong. Kalimpong and Darjeeling are two Himalayan trading towns at the crossroads with Sikkim, Bhutan, Nepal and Tibet. In 1949, Dado Rinpoche passed through Darjeeling on his way from Tibet to take up the role of abbot at Bodhgaya, arriving with mother, attendant, steward, servants and a fair-sized library. Before the war, Lama Govinda from Germany, subsequently a British citizen, was living in Darjeeling with stepmother. Govinda's teacher, the great Doma Geshe Rinpoche, had installed the imposing figure of Maitreya, seen once by the teenage Dennis, but never forgotten by Sangharachita. Sometime in 1951, Lama Govinda came to Kanipong and spent some time with me. And I was very happy to make his acquaintance and a very definite friendship did spring up between us, which lasted for many years. In fact, lasted until the time of his death. When we met in Kanipong, we talked a lot about uh, Buddhism and art, about spiritual life and art, about meditation, 
And also, of course, we talked about the, the trip that Lama Govinda had made with Lee Gautami, his wife, to Tsaparang in Western Tibet just a few years earlier. So this is the hermitage where Bento stayed and we're up and down the gravel path. He, uh, he walked and mused and wrote poetry and stayed with many of his friends. Hey, let's go. So this is the, the hermitage that Bento stayed in and it's been fixed up now. It's a guest house. We stayed in this room here. This was where the famous uh, ping pong table was. And Benta describes that the, that the room was just big enough to fit the ping pong table and you could squeeze down either side. And that's it's true. And uh, this is where the students of YMBA used to play ping pong. And towards the end of his stay here, this is when he, he began the, the survey. But this is also the room where Lee Gautami showed her drawings that she'd done from the expedition to the west of Tibet. Bente wrote a lot of poetry, of course, here, and articles. Eighteen months after his pupil's first ordination, Jagjish Kashap emerged from the jungles of Bihar to participate in Sangharachita's higher ordination in the deer park at Sarnath. A government house, Minister of Justice and lead author of the Constitution, resigned from government. The brilliant Dr. Bimro Ambedkar, the leader of the scheduled caste and himself an untouchable, had seen his Hindu code bill aiming to establish gender equality dropped from the agenda. This bill was a step towards the ultimate goal of equality, liberty, fraternity, and justice for all. Reforming Indian society would allow everyone the freedom to focus on the cultivation and expansion of the mind. He believed that the religion into which he and his followers had been born, that is to say Hinduism, was not a genuinely humanitarian religion on account of the extraordinarily hellish way in which the higher caste followers of that religion treated the untouchables. So in the end, he decided not to stage a violent revolution, not to go in for communism or Marxism, but to go in for Buddhism. The Buddha Jayanti, or 2500th anniversary of Buddhism, was an important year for me on a number of counts. I toured the Buddhist holy places as a guest of the government of India, together with Dada Rinpoche and 50 odd other eminent Buddhists from the border areas. Met the Dalai and Panchen Lamas on their arrival in Delhi. Met Dr. Ambedkar to congratulate him on his very great achievement. And had the satisfaction of seeing my book a survey of Buddhism published to widespread acclaim. Though it remained to be seen how deep or how lasting an impression the government-sponsored celebrations had made on the national psyche, the tiny movement of Buddhist revival in India was now augmented by hundreds of thousands of converts from among the followers of Dr. Ambedkar. Dr. Ambedkar died only six weeks after becoming a Buddhist and only six weeks after so many hundreds of thousands of his followers had become Buddhists. So a tremendous vacuum of leadership was left. I can't say that I myself came anywhere near filling that vacuum, but I was around and I was in demand and I did my best. I traveled very extensively in central and western India, especially among Dr. Ambedkar's followers. I consoled them as best I could after the loss of their great leader and I encouraged them to, to follow a sincerely 
and fully as they could the new religion which they had adopted. I gave lectures, I held classes, I met people. I must have come into contact in that way with at least a couple of hundred thousand people personally. Dear Dinu, so much has happened to me since leaving Bombay. In the course of four days, my own spiritual experience during this period was most peculiar. I felt that I was not a person, but an impersonal force. At one stage, I was working quite literally without any thought, just as one is in Samadhi. Also, I felt hardly any tiredness, certainly not at all what one would have expected from such a tremendous strain. When I left Nagpur, I felt quite fresh and rested. Whenever I was in Bombay, I would go to see Dinu in the flat she occupied on the seafront where she ran her school. She was quite an educated woman, and her Parsi heritage was of some importance to her. So this friendship developed between us, and I remember her wonderful teas. Then, news reached his ears of a mysterious yogi's arrival the other side of town. In that cottage, Chittal Sengi Doje lived when he was in Kalampong. And in this little cottage here, um, Bente received the green Tara Abhisheka, which was the first of Bente's tantric practices. What I had expected the famous Nyingma Lama to look like, I cannot say. But on meeting him, I received a shock. His face was so coarse and unrefined, he could have passed for a chicken farmer. At the same time, his whole being communicated such an impression of strength and reliability that one could not but feel reassured. And it was not long before the two of us were deep in conversation. The Rinpoche showed no surprise when I asked him to tell me who my guardian deity was. In fact, he seemed rather pleased, and after a moment of inner recollection, told me that my Yidam was Green Tara the female bodhisattva of fearlessness and spontaneous helpfulness. He proceeded to bestow the appropriate initiation. First he gave me the ten-syllabled mantra, after which he explained the sadhana that would enable me to visualize Green Tara and call down her blessings on myself and all sentient beings. When I finally bade him a grateful farewell, having spent more than four hours in his company, my mood was one of considerable elation. When Shatral Rinpoche came to check the Green Tara text, he heard about Sangharachita's difficulties with his landlord. Rinpoche was inspired to make a prediction. A permanent monastery would appear and have a Tibetan name meaning where the three yanas blossom. The Triyana Vardhana Vihara was not a very big monastery. Indeed, it consisted of little more than a four-roomed stone hermitage to which guest accommodation, in the form of a six-roomed thatched cottage, had been added. It had been a memorable year. In fact, it had been a veritable annus mirabilis, a year of wonders. Sitting in my room one summer afternoon, I heard footsteps coming down the steep track behind the Vihara. A few minutes later, I was being greeted by a strangely assorted pair. One was a short tyre of indeterminate age, the other a thin, angular young westerner, who overtopped his companion by at least a head and a half. Both wore Theravadin monastic robes and carried begging bowls. Sujiva was an English novice monk who had just arrived in India. Over the next couple of years, he studied with both Buddha Rakshita and Sangharachita. His account begins in 1958 when, still called Lawrence Mills, he joined a community of Buddhists in a rickety house besides the tracks. The English Sangha Trust had a difficult history of personal ambition colliding with Thai monastic political ambition, as Kantipalo recalls. The English Sangha project was inspired by an English monk who trained briefly in Thailand and then, much too soon, returned to Britain to teach. A complex character, the positive side of which 
His energy and forcefully presented Dharma talks inspired many people to practice the Dharma. On the negative side, there was more than a touch of the showman about him, and there was no doubt that he wanted disciples to ordain so that he could be their teacher. His career as a monk ended in a grand display of delusion when he announced at a large gathering that he had attained to arahantship and would disrobe and disappear. In fact, he'd become ill out of an unresolved conflict with his seriously ill teacher in Thailand. A couple of years later, with Panyavado, the one survivor of the 1956 ordinations heading the Sangha, Lawrence Mills became Shramanera Sujiva. This Buddhist Sangha was guided by Panyavadu, and it was with him that I discussed my own leaving home. I shall always be grateful for the gentleness and understanding he showed me while I was a novice under his guidance. After a year, I formed the wish to see the land where the Dharma first arose. The English Sangha Trust had very generously given me some money and a one-way ticket to India. I was invited to stay at the Thai monastery at Bodh Gaya. While I was there, I met monks studying at the new Nalanda University. One of them was very friendly. Vivekananda had been a professional kickboxer, was muscular, jolly and talkative. He was unusual amongst Thai monks then in India. Most had been novices since their early teens and were only there to get Western-style degrees. He told me of his visit to Sangharachita's mountain abode, a small monastery in the Himalayan foothills, where it was quiet and suited to both study and practice. Sangharachita appeared to be about 10 years older than I was, shorter in stature and slender in build. His movements were graceful, and his greeting of Vivekananda warm-hearted. I was already acquainted with Vivekananda. He had become a monk when of mature age after a rather turbulent secular life. He was still very fit and liked to demonstrate kicks and jumps to anyone who was interested. Friendly and unpretentious and deeply devoted to the practice of meditation, he was in many ways an ideal monk. Though for only a few days, our stay with Sangharachita gave me time to talk extensively with him on a wide variety of Buddhist topics and to admire his knowledge, wisdom and generosity. He was dedicated to the reawakening of the Buddha Dharma in India and keen to motivate others in this immense task. I found much there which was admirable. My dissatisfaction, such as it was, was illustrated by Sangharachita's informal way of communicating the Dharma. I would have welcomed a program of study classes. After spending the rains retreat at the Thai monastery in Bodh Gaya, Sujiva went on to study with Buddharachita at the Mahabodhi Society in Bangalore. In a materialistic world, you do need spiritual values and sp spiritual life. Without that, life becomes useless. Tall, physically strong, and of imposing appearance, Buddha Rachita was an impressive Dharma teacher. His face was determined and could darken quickly with anger. But as though to make up for this, his smile was relaxed and heartwarming. Of his scholarship, there could be no doubt, and his time in Ceylon and Burma had been well spent. His view of Buddha Dharma was a narrow one, which could be summed up, Theravada tradition is correct, while all other Buddhist traditions are corrupt. Difficult indeed is self-control. Attahi attanu natho kohi natho parosiya That is hard to gain indeed. These are words of wisdom coming from this sacred lips of Bhagavan Buddha the supremely enlightened master, teacher of both gods and human beings. Around him in Bangalore, there were many outcast communities with whom he had little or no contact, probably because as a former Brahmin they distrusted him. 
The people who came to listen to Buddharachita's sermons were all caste Hindus and intended to remain so. In this way, he was more isolated from potential Buddhists than Sangharachita. I did not enjoy the constriction of Buddharachita's sectarianism and dreaded his outbursts of ill humour. Though he never laid violent hands on me personally, merely uttered very angry words, I subsequently learned that many of his disciples either fled the Vihara or were thrown out by him. That I lasted there for nine months seemed something of a record. Every winter, Bhikkhu Sangharachita made preaching tours to the plains. The fourth tour extended from Maharashtra to Gujarat and lasted eight months. We were joined on this expedition by Vivekananda. Sangharachita's work of conversion was inspiring and we did whatever we could to help. Usually there was a chairman to introduce him and when all the preliminaries were finished, Sangharachita would deliver his talk. On one occasion, he spoke on the meaning and practice of the mantra Om Mani Padme Hum. His voice was persuasive and gentle, expressed the Dharma clearly and was a joy to listen to. People saw that he ate their food and expected no special treatment, not something which could be said of many Buddhist monks from outside India. Sometimes, there were so many programs, we would split up. He would be taken to one village, while I went in the opposite direction, to give a talk or sometimes conduct a conversion ceremony. I felt very close to my ex-untouchable brothers and sisters. Never before had I seen the refugees and precepts taken with the sincerity, zeal and fervour as I saw them taken by the largely illiterate and wretchedly poor ex-untouchables. It never failed to move me deeply. In July 1961, Sujiva received the higher ordination from the Thai abbot at Bodhgaya, though this time he was not handed the rolls by Mrs Mills. His mother had that honour only for the London ceremony. All the same, he became Bhikkhu Kantipalo. It must have been towards the end of November 1961 that I finally arrived for my second visit to the Triyana Vardhana Vihara. Sangharachita would light his kerosene lamp in the small hours and continue writing whatever volume he was then engaged on in his room. Sometime around dawn, the two of us would enter the shrine room and make our prostrations to the shrine. An hour of sitting meditation followed, but for me it usually passed rapidly. Such was the peace and sparkling vitality of the place. If the day was not to involve travelling or visits, the morning was taken up with correspondence or more writing, punctuated by stretching our legs on the veranda or walks in the garden. During the rains, interruptions were very few and days could pass without seeing visitors or going anywhere. Fog swirled about the Vihara and everything, paper, clothes and bedding, was damp. It was not an enjoyable time in the way of the world, but it was very profitable for Dharma practice. Meditation deepened and written pages mounted up. At the time, I was writing the group of articles that became The Three Jewels, as well as producing editorials and book reviews for the Buddhist monthly journal I edited. Kantipala was no less busy. During his first few months at the Vihara, he was giving final shape to Tolerance, his first published book. Weekly for seven months, Kantipalo and Sangharachita sat listened and wrote down the thoughts of Yogi Chen on meditation and the spiritual life. Christmas Humphreys QC, founder and president of the Buddhist Society, came to talk about the parlous state of British Buddhism. He, Toby, was frankly sick to death of the word bhikkhu. Might Bante heal the breach between the Buddhist Society and the Sangha Association? I want you to be perfectly cold and clear and I wanted a cold and clear answer. The English Sangha Trust invited me to spend some time in England. 
and at first I was undecided whether or not to accept. Kantipalo was with me when it arrived, and when he pointed out that it was my duty to help spread the Dharma in England, inasmuch as I had been born and brought up there, I could not but recognise the force of his argument. In accepting the invitation, I made it clear that I would not be staying for more than four months, possibly six. At the time I saw myself as being permanently settled in India, which I had come to regard as my spiritual home. Kantipalo made a three-month pilgrimage to Nepal. When he returned, he brought a Bodhi tree from Bodh Gaya. I love to communicate the Dharma, especially through the medium of the spoken rather than the written word. But I found it frustrating when I was not able to give full expression to my understanding of the Dharma because English was not the mother tongue of most of my auditors. With Kantipalo, there was no such limit, which made his companionship all the more welcome. Later that year, Dado Rinpoche took Sangharachita and Kantipalo through the vows of the Bodhisattva. Though they came from very different backgrounds, their friendship had ripened over several years. Sangharachita appreciated Dado Rinpoche's immense scholarship and kindness, while Rinpoche appreciated Sangharachita's noble efforts to propagate the Dharma in India, especially among the outcasts. The time came when I became, as it were, so aware of those higher spiritual qualities he had, especially the qualities of awareness and compassion, that uh, I felt, well, I can really regard him as a teacher. And at that point, I asked him for the Bodhisattva ordination. Oh. No doubt the ceremony was in Tibetan, which may account for my lack of details of this event. My mind, too, fails to provide any details of the day we took the Bodhisattva precepts, except that it was a very positive occasion, of which I retain a distinct visual impression. Rinpoche not only gave me the ordination, but subsequently explained the 64 precepts to me in considerable detail so that I was able to translate them from Tibetan into English. While I had no further contact with my two previous preceptors after receiving ordination at their hands, I was able to remain in regular personal contact with Dada Rinpoche for the rest of my stay in India. Both Sangharachita and I sought something hardly to be found in India at that time, a sense of community. We both were monks, but according to the rules, at least four bhikkhus were required to be able to be counted as a sangha. And to my surprise, in all my years as a monk in Thailand, I never discovered this sense of community. During a one-month training class, Kantipalo gives a talk on death. Sangharachita references it when he comes to give a talk to quite a different audience in London. In anticipation of visiting the West, Dado Rinpoche insists on giving Sangharachita the sadhanas of White Tara and the Medicine Buddha. London men jane se ta ham lo yahan se tibetan ko lama ek son jane se bhi itna ne ho sakega kyunki ab sab se jan pasand hai sab mil jata hai na ham aadmi lo bhi samang kaisa hota hai ab na ko jaati ko unne se jalti ho sakta hai na isliye ab ko upa mein vishwas jada rahega ham lo tibetan lo mein jane se ye bolta hai Hege, Paga, Hege, Abbe, Pichime, Dolgipot, Tem Lagega. 